Where were you born? I was born in China. China? I was born in Jifu, China. That's uh, on the Shantung Peninsula, mm -hmm. where was born. So we have something in common. And, and uh, what year, I hate to ask, but maybe what year was that? 1932. And what was your parents' background? Well, my mother was white Russian. Mm -hmm. She and her family fled Russia during the Russian Revolution, and they went across Siberia like Dr. Zhivago did. Oh, no kidding. Went to Vladivostok, and then from Vladivostok went down into China. My father, yeah. he had been in the Navy. Mm -hmm. He was originally from North Carolina, and mm -hmm. he liked China so well he stayed. I'll be darned. Then he met my mother. My schooling? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the Philippines first, and until 1945, and then I came to the States. Set, we settled in Baltimore because my dad had to, that, the government offered him a job there at Fort Holabird, and I finished high school in Baltimore, and then went to Dickinson College, and here I am. My dad liked China so well, he had married my mother, um, he was in business there. He had made lots of contacts and he liked it so well. But then one day he came home from a meeting. He had been in a meeting at one of the hotels, I think it was. Um, and he said, we're going to the Philippines because the hotel was just shelled by the Japanese. Mm -hmm. And he said, they're going to be coming to China. He said, I have some friends in the Philippines who've offered me a position there. So that's when we left in 1936 mm -hmm. and went to the Philippines. Little did we know they were going to follow us there. Now the family consisted of you, your mother, and, and my brother. Your brother. And your brother's name was? Alexander. Alexander. So off you go to Manila? Right. And well, actually to Baguio was where we, we landed in Manila, but he, uh, we went on to Baguio. Mm -hmm. We were there for two years and then came down to Manila. So 7, 36, 37, 38, yeah. so 38 year in Manila? Yeah. When did you first get a sense that things were turning in, uh, in Manila? Did your dad come home and say, hey kids, uh, things are happening? Not really. He, uh, we knew actually the spring or the fall before because my dad, we had never been to the States. My dad wanted to take us to the States, so he went to get passports and and you know, well, he did have a passport, as did my mother. But uh, and we were on with them. But they, we were told, no, you can't go until next spring, because we don't want to um, panic the Filipinos. Because by that time, all the military families had left. Mm. There were no military families left there. They had already gone to the states. And so President Roosevelt kind of gave an evacuation order? Well, I don't know that the president did, but anyway, they, mm -hmm. they went, they left. Right. And they didn't want to panic the Filipinos so that they, all the other Americans would leave. So they said, no, you can't leave right now, but you can leave next spring, mm -hmm. next April. Right. Well. So fall of 41, they've left, you're still there. What's your sense? Do you get a I was a child. Yeah. I mean, all this is, um, right now it's all what I'm trying to remember back, but at that point, I didn't really, it didn't influence me or didn't make any impression on me because I was only a child. But there had to be a point where all of a sudden your dad pulls you and your brother together and said, things have changed. Well, it was right after the bombing. Right. Yes. So the bombing occurred, what, did you know, I mean, do you have any sense what, what was going on? Uh, well, we had gone to school. Uh, school hours there were from 7, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 7 to 12, because it's so hot right. that we went to school early in the morning and we were through. We didn't have to go in the afternoon. Well, we'd gone to school. Uh, we had a chauffeur, and next thing we knew, he'd come back to get us because we had gotten the word that the Pearl Harbor had been bombed. Of course, we're one day ahead there. Right. So this was Monday <coughs> instead of Sunday. Mm 
and then we went back and then sort of sat around waiting, trying to figure out, you know, what we were going to do next. 1941 near its end, the Japanese were succeeding in closing in on Manila from two directions. The Japanese plan for choking off the Philippine capital was working perfectly. So bombing's occurring. This is December 8th. No, 7th, because we are a day ahead anyway, see. So December 7th, 1941, uh, you're, you're caught up in the same thing uh, Hawaii's caught up in. Yes. And then started, things probably start happening pretty rapidly. Very fast, yep. because they just kept coming in waves and really bombing in. MacArthur didn't want the city. You see, before the war, Manila was a beautiful, beautiful city. It was called the Pearl of the Orient. Mm -hmm. And he didn't want it destroyed, so he declared it an open city, which supposedly means you don't bomb, because they're not, nobody is down there is going to fight you at that point. I mean, they're not going to shoot your planes or anything like that. But they continued anyway. This would have, how long was the, did you get a sense of the bombing? Was How many days? Oh, goodness. Until they came in, which was first part of January. Mm -hmm. So I would say all of December. Right. Did you have any imminent fear for you at your home? Or did you guys, I mean, did you, as bombings are occurring in and around you, or at least around you, did you... Was your, was your faith tested? Were you tested? Well, I mean, oh yeah, every time we heard the siren, you know, we knew something was going to happen. We lived across the street from a Presbyterian compound, and they had dug uh, air raid shelters mm -hmm. with sandbags and so forth, and we were invited to come use that any time we felt we wanted to. So whenever the siren started, we were around, we would go across the street and go into one of the shelters. Was there any sense of trying to figure out how to get out? No, we knew we couldn't. Yeah. We were trapped. Yeah. A truck went around telling us to all stay at our homes and so forth, and then they'd let us know what they were going to do. And then another one came around and said, pack suitcases and clothes enough for two weeks. You're going to be taken, kept someplace all together. So. They came around, took us by truck, and uh, we had enough for two two weeks, supposedly, which turned out to be three years. But um, that's how we knew they were here. Now, this were they civilian truck drivers or were they Japanese? Japanese. Japanese. So the Japanese, Japanese truck drivers are speaking in English. Well, you have to realize that this is this was years in the planning, right. unbeknownst to us that they, they were Japanese all over the place. Uh, and and on the, the island. Oh, yeah. yes. Oh, yes. And as uh, soon as this happened, a lot of the people that you thought were very nice people all of a sudden had uniforms. They took us to Rizal Stadium, which was the big soccer stadium, because they didn't play football there. They played soccer. Right. And then they had already made, I guess, arrangements with the a university, the University of Santa Tomas. This was a campus, and it had uh, one big building, which was the, what, the main building, and then they had what they called the education building. The main building was four stories with a uh, roof top things. That, that's where we had our school. Um, and the other was a three-story building, but that's where they, that's where they put us, 4,000 plus. Actually, if my mother had wanted to, she could have stayed out of the camp because she was Russian. My aunt lived with us, my mother's sister, and uh, she did stay out. She was not in the camp because at that time, Russia was not a uh, Japanese foe. Um, but my, we went, and my my aunt stayed at our house. Here you are, 1942, two week vacation in a mon <laughs> in, in a monastery area. Uh, as things progressed, 
did you know that things were regressing? Yes, as soon as the food got a little worse. At the beginning, it was tolerable. The food that was coming in was tolerable. And at first, it was the, Ameri the committees ran pretty much everything, and they all, the Red Cross also paid for food that was coming in. As, oh, and also they set up, we were allowed to have people on the outside come to the gate, of course there were uh, guards and everything, come to the gate and they could bring things to us. Mm -hmm. So our servants out there, they brought us mattresses, they brought us, because there's, you know, there's nothing there, okay, so we had to have um, mosquito netting, mattresses, so forth and they also brought food. But they stopped that when things were getting worse. Our food was taken away from, the, they, the Japanese took over the food, the feeding, when it got to, and then it ended up with two, two meals a day. And toward the end, if you keep anything, keep any grain, and this would also include rice, you get weevils, you get bugs, you get all kinds of things. Well, this is what we had in our food. And we didn't, we didn't pick it out because if we did, we wouldn't have much left. So we just joke, jokingly called it our mystery meat protein. I went to school. I did what nine to 12, 12 year old children did. And it just, I never really realized quite how serious this whole thing was. They had no quarrel with the civilians, mm -hmm. but they just didn't want them out doing guerrilla work or doing anything like that, so they figured that was the best thing just to keep them together. The other thing we were made to do, um, when we passed the Japanese, we had to bow. We didn't just bow our heads, it, it was from the waist. We had to really bow, and if not, you know, you might get slapped or something like that. As the war started to turn a little bit, and the Americans were making progress in the Pacific, and you may or may not even know the progress that was occurring, uh, could you tell in the demeanor of the Japanese that things were going? Well, they changed commandants, and the, the last commandant we got was really, he was part of the, Oh, what's his name? Common Tang or something like that. It, they were the, you know, like the uh, SS troops and so forth. They were the elite, and right. he, uh, they had no time for anybody. Right. So you noticed that? I mean, there was. Oh yes. There were three gentlemen, supposedly were spying, did such and such, and they got them, and they, uh, they beheaded them. Mm-hmm. Was it a public spectacle? Uh-huh. So you all came and... Uh, uh, was there a show trial, a public trial at all? No, no trial. No trial. Summary justice? Mm -hmm. Your summary execution, I yeah. guess, no justice. Uh, I should probably ask your feelings about that as you're watching that. There again, I was a child. <laughs> it didn't... I guess I... I just thought it was terrible, yes, um, but uh, I mean, I, I really have no love for the Japanese mm -hmm. for what, so for many reasons, uh, for how atrocious they were. Um, it's uh, torturing to them was just every day. Well, first of all. The last thing that we heard was, and this turned out to be true, um, the Japanese, because they were losing, they didn't know, they, what were they going to do with us? You know, they had to do something. So they were going to take us out and kill us. Mm -hmm. And MacArthur got word of that. So he sent the Rangers and the 1st Cavalry to go straight to Santa Tomas to liberate us because, uh, because we would have been killed. Mm -hmm. They went behind enemy lines and they liberated us. And the thing that was interesting was 
when they broke down the gates that night, the Japanese were still all around us, right. but they came right on through. Uh, when they broke down the gates and we heard the tanks and stuff, we still weren't sure. You know, is it the Japanese coming in for us to take us out mm -hmm. or what until we heard a southern accent? The Japanese then ran into the uh, education building. They were in the bottom floor. The, the uh, prisoners were up on the, in the second floor. So they held out there because they weren't going to let these people come by. So my brother and my father were on the second floor there. But uh, they finally reached some agreement and they let them out. Was there any fire? There was a, a little bit, not a whole lot. Because there wasn't too much they could do with these big tanks that came in. I mean, they were surprised. Right. They held out for some, you know, the idea that they would not be killed or anything like that, yeah. so they could go out. But the and the soldiers uh, accompanied them so far and then let them go. Well, Filipinos then took over. American military protection. Yes. Uh, were they able to bring in food? I mean, yeah. Was eaten to amount to anything for three years and then mostly the last the last year they brought in butter eggs uh, all these things that and my father said now be careful now when they come in with this food don't eat too much because you haven't had too much to eat he's the one who got sick mm. but my dad my dad was not a very tall man he was five nine five ten uh, but he and he wasn't fat, but he had a very big rib cage. He was just a, he was a big man, okay? He was 210 when we were interned. Mm -hmm. He was 120 when he was liberated. We were the first group that left out of Manila Bay, and we left in March. March. I can't remember the exact date. And we left with a convoy. I think there were maybe... I, I don't know how many. It was a, a good number of ships that were with us. We went down to Hollandia, mm -hmm. and they left us there. And from Hollandia on, because we had to go around. We couldn't go straight across because the Japanese were still in those waters. Mm -hmm. So we went down toward Australia. We went to Hollandia and then up by ourselves at that point and um, didn't meet anything until frankly until between Hawaii and the mainland we had uh, a scare there was an unidentified sub that never did identify itself but then we weren't torpedoed or anything and we got landed in San Pedro what was your dad and mom's sense towards the Japanese did they I, I, remember you mentioned you hadn't talked about it did you get a at least uh, an emotion. Well, they, they didn't like them. Yeah. I mean, after all this that had happened. Sure. But they didn't talk much about it, something. No, they didn't. They, they That was a part of their life that just, they didn't talk about it. Right. So I never really knew anything that was going on until, until I took that trip in 95 mm -hmm. and decided on my own that I was going to find out more about what was going on. What did you find out? Found out that just how serious the whole thing was. It wasn't just games and fun, yeah. like I had enjoyed at that point, right. but, uh, and just how, how close to death I did come. Mm -hmm. We're called the Stick Bells, S-T-I-C, Santa Tomas Internment Camp Bells. Because I went through all the seriousness in my early life, um, as I said, I appreciate life, and there's, I don't get too upset with a lot of things because it's, in the scheme of things, it's really not that important. Mm -hmm. Well, this, this, this has been terrific. What haven't I asked you? What is the question that you'd say, gee, I, he, he missed this one? I can't think of anything. Um, the picture he was, Bill, you want to bring the picture in? The picture he was speaking of, I got from the army, and I had it uh, framed, or not framed, but put on poster board. Mm -hmm. And what this was, was uh, 
after the Americans came in, they were showing us, they would show us movies and or um, like a USO type of thing to keep us entertained. We're in this room up here, the second floor. So this was our great big front plaza or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. And they were, it was some sort of a um, show they were giving. But the first movie they showed us was The Chocolate Sh Soldier with Nelson Eddy. My parents never spoke of it after we were liberated. Um, I. As a child, when I went to school and people found out I was there, they seemed to be interested and they said, tell, tell us about it. I would start to talk to them and as I was talking to them, all of a sudden I would see they're looking at something over there, they're looking at something over there. And I finally decided they're not really interested. These people here are not interested. So I, never, I really didn't talk much about it. Yeah. But it was, it was very emotional actually for me to talk about it. Mm -hmm. So for years I never said anything. I knew I had to have a closure of some sort. In 1995, I was circularized by one of my very good, I didn't know, what, backtrack again, when we landed in California, people went their separate ways. They went all different places. And we had to more or less be sponsored, but my, bro my father's family in North Carolina spoke for us. So we went to North Carolina. Other people went Massachusetts, Washington. A lot stayed in California. But anyway, I lost t contact with all my friends that I had grown up with in the camp. In 95, I got a circular from a, one of the gals who was in the camp with us. And if you had seen Ken Burns' War, mm -hmm. Sasha. Yeah. She uh, wanted to get a group together to go back to the Philippines to commemorate 50 years of our liberation. And she got my name because I belonged to um, ex-prisoner, ex-American, American ex-prisoners of war, anyway. So I said to Bill, I want to go back. I have to go back. I said, I would like you to come with me, but if you don't feel you don't want to come, that's fine. Well, he went, he said, of course I'm going. My trip back in 95 and reconnecting with a lot of my friends, now this is 50 years later, I hadn't seen them at all, really opened up, opened my, me up into speaking more even though it's still a lot, it's still very emotional many times. Uh, and I became more interested in really what was going on. I have read voraciously with a lot of things, as you ask, it's anything written. I have a whole library upstairs, if you'd like to see it, sure. on everything that went on at that time, written by army, by people who were in there, so forth. It's, and I have learned really quite how serious this whole thing was. When I was there, I, it, to me it wasn't. Nine to 12, I had my friends there. I didn't know, as long as I was being fed, even though it wasn't a whole lot. I went to school, I played soccer, I played basketball, I had a great time. Mm -hmm. But uh, reading all these things now, I really know just quite how serious this whole thing was. This has been terrific. Very, very interesting. Thank you.